Hello, and thank you very much for joining us for this LGC, Dr. Aaron Storfer panel discussion podcast on the very exciting and constantly evolving topic of nitrosamines. My name is Richard Medeiros, and I'm the Sales Product Specialist for Environment, Food, and Forensics at LGC Standards, and I'm here to moderate this discussion. We're joined today by our very knowledgeable panel of Dan Bigger's staff, Technical Director at LGC, Mike Ludlow, Science Lead of Analytical and Material Science at LGC, and we're pleased to be joined by Ben Priest, our special guest from Cambridge Isotope Laboratories. Thank you all very much for joining us today. So I'd like to go around and get uh, just a brief introduction from all of our panelists. Dan, if you could tell us a bit about yourself and your specific expertise with nitrosamines. Sure. I uh, have been doing reference material manufacturing uh, since 1997, when we originally started uh, our location, O2SI. We started off in the environmental testing industry as a custom reference material manufacturer. And the nitrosamines have always been an important part of the uh, environmental industry. Uh, so uh, we, we've been working with them through our entire existence. And uh, as far as uh, O2SI, we joined with LGC in November of 2016, uh, where we use our custom solution manufacturing experience to just bring uh, efficiency and uh, value to reference materials for, uh, for the laboratories. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, uh, Dan. I appreciate that. Mike, could you tell us a bit about yourself as well? Yeah, thanks, Rich. Uh, my name is Mike Dudlow. Um, and as, as you said, I'm the science lead. My background is analytical chemistry, so primarily chromatography and spectroscopy, looking at trace level organic analysis. So I've been with LGC for around tw 20 years now, and uh, my team basically provide contract analytical services, primarily to pharmaceutical and consumer healthcare. Great. Thank you, Mike. Um, okay. And Ben, um, thanks for joining us. We appreciate you being here. Um, if you wouldn't mind, could you take a moment just to tell us a bit about yourself and some of your work with Cambridge Isotope Laboratories? Sure, thank you. Um, I'm Ben Priest. I'm the business development manager for the environmental product line at Cambridge Isotope Laboratories. Um, Cambridge Isotopes has been around for four decades now, um, specializing in isotopically labeled standards um, for many different research projects. Um, our group focuses on environmental standards, uh, going back to the early days of the dioxin analyses and PCBs and pesticides and many other compounds. Um, we've been working very closely with LGC for a very long time, also several decades, and uh, we're um, very happy to be joining you with this uh, podcast for nitrosamines. Um, as mentioned earlier, nitrosamines have been a big part of the environmental testing for a long time. Uh, and we've developed uh, stable isotope labeled uh, NDMA and other compounds for many decades. So happy to join you and uh, look forward to this. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, we're, we're very happy to have you as well. We appreciate it. Okay. So let's jump right in and get started with our topics. Uh, where are nitrosamines measured? Well, nitrosamines are uh, measured in a, a broad variety of areas. It's, uh, they're important in, in pharma. Uh, they're uh, a big contaminant in tobacco smoke. Uh, they're present in foods, uh, in the environment. Uh, they're present in consumer healthcare products. Uh, and the issue is, is that all of the nitrosamines, or at least almost all of the nitrosamines, uh, especially uh, in nitrosodimethylamine or NDMA, are highly carcinogenic at the part per trillion concentration level. So uh, they're present in the tobacco smoke. So anyone breathing secondhand smoke will be exposed. Uh, they're present in processed meats that use a lot of uh, the nitrate and nitrite as a preservatives. Uh, these react with the amino acids and produce nitrosamines. 10% uh, of the drinking water sources tested in the US contained NDMA uh, as of 2011. Hmm. Uh, one of the issues is that NDMA is totally miscible in water, 
which really allows it to migrate quickly in the environment. So if you get soil contamination uh, from, say, a manufacturing process and then it rains, uh, the rain will just wash the uh, contamination right into groundwater and, and cause groundwater contamination. And in the pharma sector, there's been a number of recent incidents over the past couple of years where um, nitrosamines have been detected in, in drug products, specifically in uh, ranitidine and sartan related products, which have actually been withdrawn from the market. So the pharma industry now has to risk assess the potential for nitrosamines and their formation in all production processes for drugs. Uh, another area is e-cigarette products, so and looking for the potential presence of nitrosamines in these new products. Okay, fantastic. So how do nitrosamines end up in drinking water, surface water, and wastewater? Well, nitrosamines are uh, usually reaction intermediates or uh, reaction byproducts. Uh, they're very seldom used uh, directly. They're formed as intermediates in the commercial azo dye production. Uh, so uh, effluents from those facilities uh, could have nitrosamines in them. There are also degradation byproducts of aqueous amines uh, during the post-combustion capture of CO2 and fossil flue gases, uh, fossil fuel flue gases. Uh, aqueous metal working uh, fluids that contain secondary amines release amines into wastewater, which then become uh, starting materials uh, for the nitrosamines. Also in the production of 1,1-dimethylhydrazine, which is a liquid rocket fuel, nitrosamines are produced there as well. Nitrosamines were first found in drinking water, uh, predominantly with uh, surface water systems that use the chloramination disinfection uh, process. If there was an upstream wastewater discharge that provided organic nitrogen precursors like dimethylamine, those would react with the dichloramine uh, to produce the nitrosamines. The uh, actual original detection of nitrosamines in treated uh, drinking water was caused by a, an amine-based uh, coagulant aid that was used to clarify the water. It's a similar story in the drug products area. Basically, anytime, anytime there's a presence of amines and nitrite sources, there's a potential for forming these nitrosamines. So these can come from the drug products themselves, solvents, intermediates, or impurities. So there's a whole range of sources. Great. Thank you for that nitrosamine overview. Now, I'd like to focus on the important topic of regulation. Now, regarding regulations, are there limits on the concentrations of nitrosamines that can be in these waters, and what are those uh, regulations? Well, in the U.S., uh, on a national level, the EPA has uh, considered these nitrosamines as emerging contaminants, and six of the nitrosamines were added to the Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule, or the UCMR, List 2 uh, for drinking water in 2007. And with that, because the concentrations were so low, the EPA developed EPA Method 521, which is a, a GC tandem mass spec method in which they actually target seven different nitrosamines and uh, at reporting levels of two to seven parts per trillion. For uh, the wastewater area, the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, or NPDES, uh, is used to set limits. And with that, a regulatory limit is really determined on a per site basis by the level of risk to both the health and environment, the volume of the discharge, and the volume of the receiving waters. And uh, for wastewater, EPA developed three methods. EPA method 607, which is a GC nitrogen phosphorus detector. Uh, EPA method 625, which is, is a GC mass spec method, and EPA method 1625, which is an isotope dilution GC mass spec method. In the solid and hazardous waste program area, uh, EPA released EPA methods 8070, which is uh, similar to 607. It's a GC 
nitrogen phosphorus detector, an EPA method 8270, which is a GC mass spec detector. The EPA listed uh, the nitrosamines as priority toxic pollutants, but currently there's no national maximum contaminant level or MCL assigned to them yet. However, they did release a screening level of 0.42 parts per trillion in drinking water. That one uh, Superfund site, the Aerojet General Corporation Superfund site in California, they established a 1.3 part per trillion groundwater remediation target. So just an incredibly low uh, detection limits or concentrations. California, uh, as a state, issued a 10 part per trillion notification level for NDMA, NDEA, and NDPA in uh, drinking water. And the state of Massachusetts actually set a state MCL of 10 parts per trillion. The FDA and the EMA have both issued new regulatory guidance over the past 12 to 18 months for drug products, and they currently list eight target nitrosamines. The levels of detection required are based on the route of administration to the patient, but they're typically in the PPB sort of range. But the complex nature of the sample matrices means that well-characterized high-quality standards are essential. So the availability of pre-prepared calibration standards helps increase the sample throughput through the lab and also reduces testing errors. The variety of these target analytes and products means internal reference standards are vital to ensure high-quality test results. Yeah, and from Cambridge Isotopes, we've been uh, supporting the environmental analyses for a long time, uh, specifically with more of the common uh, NDMA and the ethylamine and propylamine uh, compounds uh, with the stable isotope labeled standards for those. Um, but more recently, especially with the pharma increased research and, and new findings, we've been developing new standards as well for uh, NMBA, uh, one of the other compounds that was found in the pharmaceutical matrix and uh, methylethylamine and some other compounds that were not as commonly analyzed. Um, but now we have the labeled standards available for those, as well as supporting the earlier methods, the 521 and, and 1625 methods that we've, we've been uh, making standards for for quite some time. Thank you. That gives us a great understanding of nitrosamine regulations. Another important area for labs is methodology and challenges surrounding those methods. So what's the best way to prepare samples before measuring nitrosamines? Um, and what are some typical challenges that laboratories might run into when preparing samples for nitrosamine analysis? Great question. And the, the sample preparation really will depend on the type of matrix uh, that you're analyzing. For drinking water, which is a relatively clean matrix, a, a very nice solid phase extraction sample preparation method has been developed. For wastewater, it, it's a bit more complex, and there we use liquid-liquid extraction, followed up with fluorocyl and aluminum column cleanup if it's necessary. For the solid and hazardous waste program area, those can be the most complex environmental matrices that we deal with. And with that, again, we use liquid-liquid extraction with the fluorocyl and aluminum column cleanup. The primary challenges are just the very low part per trillion detection limits that are needed. You can get interferences from a variety of primary and secondary amine components that are in the matrices, contaminated glassware, contaminated reagents. Other issues are that we can get thermal decomposition of the nitrosamines during the sample concentration after we do the liquid-liquid extraction. But nitrosamines are also UV light sensitive. Yeah, there's also the potential because we're looking at such low levels for contamination from lab consumables, typically sort of rubber-based products such as gloves, stoppers and seals, which are commonly used in the laboratory. And in pharma, we've also had some a number of issues with um, pharma uh, nitrosamine-related derivatives coming from the packaging itself. So, for example, in blister packs that contain nitrocellulose, they can potentially either contain nitrosamines themselves or the precursors that actually form them during the, within the drug product. Yes, and 
Actually, uh, one of the top reasons for having the stable isotope labeled standards available is to try to overcome some of these challenges. Having the uh, actual compounds of interest as, as surrogate compounds or surrogate standards allows you to get good identification of each of the compounds of primary interest, but also, um, especially in the very low detection limits needed, allows for a good stable quantitation at those low levels. And again, working in different types of matrices, having a isotopically labeled uh, internal or surrogate recovery standard will allow you to overcome some of the challenges of, of other matrix interferences as well. So we think it really uh, is uh, a valuable tool to have these things available for a lot of these uh, methods and to overcome these challenges. Yeah, great point, Ben, thank you. So. Are there any nitrosamine compounds that are harder to quantify than others, uh, and why? Well, on the environmental side, uh, the N-nitroso diphenylamine uh, readily converts to and coalutes with diphenylamine. And we've seen similar issues in the um, in the pharma area where NDMA actually um, coalutes with dimethylformamide, which is a common solvent used in the drug production process and it can potentially cause false positives and yeah, so erroneous results. Great, excellent. Uh, so is there a preferred technique for measuring nitrosamines in these samples? Um, and are there specific methods labs should be following when they prepare samples and generate data on nitrosamines? Well, for reporting environmental results in the US, uh, the EPA methods must be used. The FDA and EMA guidance for pharma includes a number of suggested methods, and these include both high-resolution LCMS and GCMS techniques, but it does allow testing using any suitably qualified method. So that puts the emphasis on the analyst to actually qualify the method, and um, it brings into account the validation issues that we're going to come on to. Okay, great. So if a lab is following a published method, how do they guarantee they're following the method correctly and reporting data uh, exactly the way that they're meant to? Well, the EPA methods uh, have uh, pretty well-defined quality control requirements for calibration linearity, uh, independent calibration verification, and uh, sample preparation quality control. As a ISO 17025 and ISO 17034 accredited certified reference material or CRM manufacturer, LGC can provide all of these solutions. For calibration, the Dr. Ehrenstorfer brand has a broad line of CRM calibration solutions, as well as the expertise to prepare custom solutions to meet any laboratory's needs and maximize their efficiency. Along with these, we can provide uh, both internal standard and surrogate CRM isotopically label solutions above and beyond what is uh, even required by the methods. For the independent calibration verification solution part, Dr. Aaron Storfer uh, can provide uh, completely independent CRM solutions from the primary calibration solutions as a mean to validate the calibration curves. We can use uh, uh, entirely separate source uh, raw materials uh, or neat materials for the pre preparation of those. For sample preparation quality control, Dr. Aaron Storfer can provide laboratory control spiking solutions and isotopically labeled uh, surrogate CRM solutions uh, to help with the sample preparation quality control uh, verification part. We can provide these solutions as uh, either high concentration solutions that the end user would then uh, take and dilute to make their daily working standards, or we can even uh, go ahead and provide them as point of use solutions that the laboratory can just load directly on their instruments uh, and run them, uh, which would save them time and a lot of documentation effort. Now, what if a lab isn't following a specific method? Do they have to develop their own method in-house? Yes, uh, but the analytical portion of the uh, of the analysis is really pretty well established for a number of different analytical techniques. The, the primary challenge would be developing the sample preparation technique if the sample wasn't amenable to one of the current methods. 
there are a variety of validation steps would need to be performed to ensure that the technique would be sensitive enough to achieve the detection limit that's desired and selective enough not to be biased due to some sort of matrix interference. Achieving these results on uh, similar types of CRM matrix materials would help demonstrate that the sample preparation technique is adequate. And we, we see similar validation issues in the drug testing area where the ICH best practice guidelines apply. So again, the complex product matrices mean that's good sample preparation methodology and the availability of, for example, labeled standards to demonstrate recovery are really vital. The majority of methods are based on the LCMS methods. The majority of methods are based on LCMS, which is particularly susceptible to interferences from, for example, excipients. There are also some new regulations, which mean we're beginning to see a requirement to test for nitrosamine derivatives of the drug API. So there's a need for possible custom synthesis of standard reference materials above and beyond the standard nitrosamines. Yeah, and CIL offers uh, about a dozen or so isotopically labeled standards that can be um, matched into specific methodologies that are being used. So um, there's there's more than uh, just required by the, the common methods that are out there. Um, and we're always happy to work with laboratories to define what they need and, and how to prepare what they need for their methods. So how could a lab guarantee that their in-house method will allow them to generate and report data that's meaningful to their customers? Really, by following good laboratory practices and establishing quality control criteria, and that would include uh, having uh, criteria for uh, the linearity of their calibration curves, uh, being able to validate that those calibrations are accurate, and that they're getting acceptable recovery on a known independent standard, being able to demonstrate that they can achieve uh, acceptable matrix spike, uh, analyte, and surrogate recovery through the sample preparation process, and achieving uh, acceptable recovery on a performance evaluation standard. Uh, that's a, it's a completely blind standard coming through. If a lab does these things, they can generate legal defensible data that can be used for regulatory and policy making decisions. Of course, along with that, the, the quality and defensibility of the standards are just as important. And our standards are manufactured under the 17034 accreditation for reference material manufacturers. And our standards are gravimetrically traceable back to NIST. All of our solutions are tested after manufacturing in our ISO 17025 accredited quality control laboratory to verify that these solutions meet our manufacturing specifications. We also perform accelerated and classical long-term stability testing to make sure that the products are suitable during their entire shelf life. LGC also has an entire division that's uh, devoted to manufacturing performance evaluation samples so a laboratory can demonstrate an ongoing basis, on, on an ongoing basis, that their methods are producing uh, accurate results. We also, uh, with our certified concentrations, we provide the total combined uncertainty of the concentration so the laboratory will know for sure that our standards are fit for use. Excellent points, gentlemen, thank you. Um, all right, well, thank you for joining us for this podcast. And again, um, thank you very much to all of our panelists. We do hope you found this discussion very useful. I'd like to remind you that LGC, Dr. Aaron Storfer, can support you with an extensive range of high quality nitrosamine reference materials, which you can find in our new brochure. If you do have any further inquiries or questions, please feel free to contact us via our social media channels on LinkedIn and Twitter, or via our website, lgcstandards.com. Once again, thank you very much for joining us.